الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to this next uh, lecture as part of our uh, Forgotten Legacy Conference and inshallah ta'ala I have uh, what is really an amazing, amazing story to share with you, an amazing legacy to share with you this evening, insha'Allah ta'ala. And it's all to do with the madrasa that shares the same name as Al Madrasa Tul Umariya. The Madrasa Al Umariya, not the Madrasa Al Umariya of today, the online Madrasa Umariya that you're watching, but the original Madrasa. Al-Umariya, how it was founded, and the story of the Maqasida or the Maqdisiyin, and it really is an inspiring, inspiring story, and it's really well, well worth it to go through, inshallah ta'ala, and lots of benefits and lots of lessons for us, inshallah. So this story begins at the turn of the 6th century of the Islamic calendar around about 500 years after the Hijrah. What was the state of the Muslims in that time? The Khilafah was weak in Baghdad. There were all different kinds of factions that held significant power over the government. The First Crusade had already begun, encouraged by Pope Urban II and the French Crusaders had invaded the Levant. They took over Beit al-Maqdis. They established something that they called the Kingdom of Jerusalem, and they gave different parts of the land to different Crusader rulers. And within that land, the land of Beit al-Maqdis, what is now in Palestine, and this land within this land of Palestine, uh, or the land of Beit al-Maqdis is a land called Jemma'il or Jemma'in and it is close to Nablus in what is now the West Bank and it was given as part of the Nablus mountain region to a really evil and tyrannical ruler who was called Ibn Barzan he was called Ibn Barzan He's also written as Barisan. And his name that he is given in the Western world is Balian of Ibelin. And subhanAllah, when I came across this name, what amazed me is that when you actually look up this person, you find that they even made uh, films about his life, about how honorable he was, about how, you know, what an amazing figure he was in history. And actually he was a tyrant who terrorized his people. And he was a person who in the Islamic books, it is written just how evil this individual was, that he was among the worst of all of the crusaders, Balian of Ibelin. He later surrendered Jerusalem, and this is what is famous in the this is what they kind of know him for, that he surrendered Jerusalem to Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, uh, who died 589 after the Hijrah. So the real story of Balian of Ibelin is that he was a tyrant and he would force the Muslims to work on farmlands, chopping off people's hands and legs so that they wouldn't run away. He would imprisoned them. He had a very harsh and a very, very severe sort of tax regime. They said that he took four times more than any other crusader ruler took from, his pe from, from the, the people. So we now know the situation we're talking about. We've set the scene for the story of al madrasa al umariya The Khilafah is weak in Baghdad. The Muslims are broken into factions and into different groups. And in fact, some of those groups actually have more power 
than the caliph holds. And we know that the first crusade has begun and the kingdom of Jerusalem has been established by the crusaders. And that among the worst of all of the crusaders at that time was a man known as Ibn Barazan or known in Western terms as Balian of Ibelin. And that he was a very evil and tyrannical person as opposed to what the Western modern kind of take on him is as a very heroic and very kind of gentle and noble and loving all religions. I guess they missed the bits off where he used to, you know, chop the hands and legs off of the Muslims in order to force them to work on the farms and stop them being able to run away. The bit where he took four times higher taxes than any other crusader ruler. And he was considered by the Muslim historians to be among the worst of the rulers of the crusader rulers that took over that area of Bayt al-Maqdis. And in this land of Jemma'il, which is this village or this town, there was a great scholar whose name was Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi, rahimahullah ta'ala. He died 558 after the Hijrah. Now, I'll give you a warning at this point that there's going to be, this is a story about the Maqdisiyin. So it's a story about a family of people and each person in this family has, they have quite similar names. All of their names end Al-Maqdisi. They were from Jerusalem, so they had that name of someone who comes from Beit Al-Maqdis, Al-Maqdisi. And so the names might be similar. So this is Ahmed ibn Muhammad. This is Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Qudama Al-Maqdisi. And he was from a family who traced their lineage back to Salim ibn Abdullah ibn Umar, who died 106 after the Hijrah. Uh, the Sheikh, Sheikh Ahmed, he traveled from Jamma'il, he didn't stay in Jamma'il, and he traveled all over the Muslim world to seek knowledge. He traveled to Iraq, he traveled to Sham, he traveled to Egypt, and he came back and he started to teach the people. He used to teach them Quran, he used to teach them fiqh, he used to teach them hadith, and he used to give a khutbah every Friday, and it used to really touch the people's hearts. And the news of Sheikh Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi, it spread far and wide. And the news of his lectures and lessons reached Ibn Barazan, reached Balian of Ibelin. And he was informed that this is starting to affect your workers. Your, your, your workers now, we're starting to see the effects of this teacher who is teaching Quran, Aqidah, Fiqh, Hadith. And he's teaching the people and particularly his Jumu'ah Khutbah. It is affecting the workers. And it's having an effect on your agriculture and your production. And so, again, the supposedly tolerant, friendly, we love all religions, Balian of Ibelin, actually commanded for Sheikh Ahmed to be killed. However, there was a man in the camp of Balian, whose name was Ibn Ida Tasir or Tusyar, and he was a man who worked for him as his scribe and minister. And he was inclined towards the Muslims. He had good thoughts of the Muslims. He had a good, uh, a good attitude towards the Muslims. And he decided that he would inform Sheikh Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi. He would inform him, rahimahullah ta'ala, that the order has been given for you to be killed. And so he informed him of this, and he was able to escape. Sheikh Ahmed was able to escape and to head towards Damascus, towards Damascus. And he left almost all of his family behind. There were three people with him on this journey, two of his nephews and his brother-in-law. And this was in the year 551 after the Hijrah. So he went with great difficulty. Not only did he have to escape uh, 
Beit al-Maqdis, which was come under the control of the Crusaders, and he has a bounty on his head. But he also now has to navigate through Crusader territory. When he reaches Muslim territory, he's also not safe because he, the, the territory is not the government, the Muslim government at that time is not stable. They are not, they don't have safety and you know, security in every place. Instead, the road is dangerous. There are bandits, there are highway robbers, there are all kinds of, there are crusaders. And so he's sneaking his way slowly to reach Damascus. And when he reaches Damascus, it's not like there's a welcoming party for him. It's not like there's somebody there to welcome him. He is just another traveler on the road, just another person uh, who is making the journey towards Damascus. And he reaches there. And in those days, the Masajid were controlled by particular madhahib, a madhab. So there was like a Hanbali masjid, a Shafi'i masjid, and so on. The masajid were controlled by the madhab or associated with the madhab. And outside the eastern gate of Damascus, there was a Hanbali masjid, which was called Masjid Abi Salih. And the reason it was called the Masjid of Abu Salih is that it was founded by a man called Abu Salih al Hanbali. It was from the Hanbali madhab, associated himself to the Hanbali madhab. And he was called Abu Salih. Al-Hanbali. And Abu Salih al-Hanbali had set a waqf, an endowment. And, and that's, how, uh, that's how Islamic projects used to be funded in those days, either through the government or, or whatever it might be, but they were funded through a waqf, through a waqf. So what would happen is that a business, uh, a premises would be rented, something would be rented out or, or business would be carried out and the prophets would sustain the masjid. So there was a man, presumably he was a wealthy man called Abu Salih al-Hanbali and he established an endowment to fund this masjid, to build and fund this masjid, which came to be known as Masjid Abi Salih, the Masjid of Abu Salih. And Sheikh Ahmed bin Muhammad bin Qudama al-Maqdisi, he wrote a letter to his family and he asked them to come after him. He asked them to join him in Damascus because he settled in that place. He settled in that masjid just on the outside of, of Damascus, outside of the gates of Damascus. He found himself settled there and he asked his family to come. And he knew what he was asking them to do was a big ask. He knew it was a difficult thing, it's not easy. So he said to them in, in what he wrote, he said, he quoted the ayah, the ayah from uh, the ayah from Surah Ibrahim. فَمَنْ تَبِعَنِي فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي وَمَنْ عَصَانِي فَإِنَّكَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Whoever follows me, this person is one of me. And whoever disobeys me, you are al ghafur rahim He sent it back with those two family members who had gone with him because he came with his uh, he came with a party of, of, of those people who made the journey with him. Some of them went back. And when the letter reached his family, they only waited one night and they left everything that they had. They left their home, they left their friends, they left whatever wealth they had. And they went to join Ahmed, Sheikh Ahmed bin Muhammad bin Qudama al-Maqdisi just outside of Damascus in Masjid Abi Saleh. When they set out to travel from Beit al-Maqdis to Damascus, they were 35 people, including three of his sons, four of his daughters, several uh, and several small grandchildren. But when the Crusaders heard and saw, because when one person escaped, it was bad enough. When 35 people, including women and children, escaped, now the Crusaders are determined that they will not be embarrassed like that again. They were embarrassed by the fact that Sheikh Ahmed was able to escape. And especially because as we know that Balian had himself, uh, you know, he wanted himself to be 
a sort of a kingmaker. He wanted to have a senior role in the kingdom of Jerusalem. So it looks terrible for him as a leader of the people that he has put forward a, a command for this man to be killed and he escaped. And now not only did he escape, but his whole family escaped, 35 people. So soldiers were sent to capture them. And they have soldiers chasing them from Beit al-Maqdis. They pass through Crusader territory where they have to move only at night. Many times they lost their way on the way to Damascus. They didn't have, and they were not able to uh, find the road and, because they were traveling at night. And they were attacked by bandits and kidnappers in several places along the road. So when they made it finally to the masjid in Damascus, it's not like the place they came to was a, you know, people think like it's the, you know, this only happens in the, in the stories, you know, that uh, people travel through the night, they have people chasing them, they have bandits attacking them, they keep, you know, they keep surviving and surviving and surviving and then finally they reach the masjid and then that's everything is happy and it's a wonderful ending to the story, but it wasn't like that. The masjid area was filthy and it was infested by mosquitoes. 28 of the family members died of malaria. Also, not only that, but you would think that the masjid, the family of the people of the masjid, that the family of, 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 of uh, Abi Saleh al-Hanbali would have welcomed the Sheikh to the masjid, but actually, as we know, we experience in our lives, there was a certain amount of hostility there was a certain amount of, you know, feeling that people might be stepping on people's toes. And so they feared the family of Abi Saleh al-Hanbali, they thought they might lose the right to the masjid because they saw how popular Sheikh Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Khudama al-Maqdisi, how popular he was. And they saw how his whole family, I mean, suddenly it's one person, then it's 35 people and there are all these family members are coming. Uh, and then more on the way. And so the feeling is that they might lose their right to the endowment. They might lose the income that they're getting. Uh, and that's not to say that, they, you know, it's not to question people's sincerity. Or we don't know enough about what happened, but we know that there was hostility and there was a fear that they would lose the masjid and they would lose the benefits that came from it for their own family because of the new arrivals. So at that time, Damascus as a city, Damascus, it was run by Nuruddin Mahmoud Az-Zanki. Sometimes it's, they, they pronounce it as zengi He died 569 after the Hijrah. He was originally a Turk and his father was Shi'i or strongly inclined towards the Shia, Rafidah. He was strongly inclined towards the the Rafidi Shi'i belief, his father. However, Nur al-Din was a righteous man. He was known for his righteousness. He was chaste. He didn't take people's wealth. He was known for being someone that was both brave and humble, such that it was said about him in a line of poetry, that he gathered between bravery and humility to his Lord. What an excellent mihrab in the mihrab. What does it mean, what an excellent mihrab in the mihrab? It means what an excellent warrior. The, the, word, the first word mihrab here means warrior. What an excellent warrior in the mihrab. And he was in the mihrab because he was the governor of the city, leading the people in prayer. And he was a mihrab and he was a warrior. So what an excellent warrior in the mihrab. And his chief justice, who was known by the title Qadi al Khuda, the chief justice, was a noble imam. His name was Sharafuddin bin Abi Asrun. He died 585 after the Hijrah. He was a great Shafi'i jurist. And he taught two of Ahmed's sons. He taught Abu Umar, so that is Abu Umar, the son of who? The son of Ahmed, who is the son of Muhammad, Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi. 
So we're going to keep his name to keep it simple. We're going to call him Abu Umar. The father, we're going to call him Sheikh Ahmed. Just because all otherwise the Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi is going to keep coming so many times, we're going to get confused. So we're going to call Sheikh Ahmed is the father. He has a son called Abu Umar. He died 607 after the Hijrah. His name was Muhammad and he was the eldest. And also he had a son who was known as Abdullah. And he is known as Muwaffaquddin ibn Qudama. Or more commonly, he's just known by the name Ibn Qudama. Let's just run by that again because it's going to get confusing. The father who went uh, through the Islamic countries to study came back to Jamma'il and was uh, a target for assassination by Ibn Barazan, by Balian of Ibelin. This is, we're going to call him Sheikh Ahmed, Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Qudama al Maqdisi. And he has two sons that we want to focus on here. One of them is called Abu Umar, and the other one is known more commonly by Ibn Qudama. That's how he's known. His name was Abdullah, Muwaffaq al Din Ibn Qudama, but he's the one who is most commonly known as Ibn Qudama. That's the one that when you hear the name Ibn Qudama, most commonly Ibn Qudama al Maqdisi, the author of Umdat al Fiqh and al Mughni. Uh, he died 620 after the Hijrah. He is the, the one that you know most commonly hear him called Al Muwaffaq ibn Qudama. So we're going we're gonna to call him like that. We're going to call it Sheikh Ahmed, Abu Umar, and Al Muwaffaq ibn Qudama. And Al Muwaffaq ibn Qudama, he actually tells what he actually tells a little bit about this period that we're talking about. He said, لَمَّا قَدِمْنَا مِنْ أَرْضِ بَيْتِ الْمَقْدِسِ When we came from the land of Jerusalem, كُنَّا نَتَرَدَّدُ إِلَى الْقَاضِ إِبْنِ عَسْرُونَ مَعَ أَخِي He said, me and my brother, we used to regularly keep coming back to the lessons of Ibn Asrun. Sometimes he's called Ibn Abi Asrun. In some of the historical reports, he's known as Ibn Asrun. And in some of them, he's known as Ibn Abi Asrun. The Shafi'i Qadi, the, the head judge, the chief judge of Nur al-Din Azanki, who was the governor of Damascus. He said, Nesma'u darsahu fil khilaf. We heard, we used to learn his lessons about differing. What does it mean we used to learn lessons about differing? Al khilaf here, what they mean is that they were studying from him fiqh at the level of the differences of opinion among the scholars and the differences between the madhahib, the different madhabs. So they were studying fiqh from him. He said, And he said, we used to go to him, then we stopped going. Because people said to us, you people have become Ash'ari. Now, we need to stop here and just sort of understand a few points. So, the Ash'ari Aqidah is a deviant, a deviant belief, which is really based in, in three things. It's based in giving precedence to the intellect over the text of revelation, textual revelation, that the intellect is given precedence and it's more important than the text of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. The second thing is rejecting singular reports uh, in Aqidah. So not taking reports that are not reported by many, many, many different people, even if they're authentic, not taking them. And the third is changing some of the meanings of Allah's names and attributes and distorting the meanings of Allah's names and attributes. Uh, based on those two previous points that we mentioned. Now that's a very brief summary. Actually, it's more complicated than that. There are many, many more issues they had, including issues regarding Qadr and Qala and Iman and so many different things. But these three things are, are fairly common and you can, under, you, you can get a good understanding because it's not the point of our discussion. But this deviant group... Uh, Sheikh Ahmed and his children were far away from that. 
and they didn't have any, you know, they, they were not connected to that. They were far from it. And they were upon the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and upon the way of the Salaf Rahimahumullahu Ta'ala, the early generations and what they believed. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions and the generations that came after that, they were not Ash'ari. They did not have these beliefs. These beliefs were introduced by the Jews and the Christians by way of, or were introduced by the the Indians and the Greeks and the Romans by way of the Jews and the Christians until they reached the likes of Jaham ibn Safwan and Ja'ad ibn Dirham, Jaham ibn Safwan and then onwards until finally, you know, it kind of developed through the Jahmiyyah and so on, the Mu'tazila and then opposite to them, the Asha'ira and Abu al-Hasan al-Ash'ari, rahimullah ta'ala, who repented from uh, a lot of, uh, of that. Yeah. But the point is that that wasn't what the early generations were upon. It wasn't what the, the Prophet ﷺ and his companions were upon. So the family, the Maqdisi family, they were upon the Sunnah. And they heard a rumor or an accusation that Ibn Asrun, the Shafi'i judge, was, was an Ash'ari. And, or that his durus were attended by the Ash'ari. The Ash'aris used to attend his durus. That kind of thing. And so they stopped going. And this is something, you know, subhanAllah, it's, it's amazing that, you know, we talked about the masjid and how, you know, they were having those problems with who's in charge of the masjid back in those days. They were having those problems of who's in charge of the masjid and who gets the income from the masjid and things like that. They also had the same problems we have over these, well, yeah, subhanAllah, not, not, perhaps not as bad as we have it, but the, the issues over... You know, why are you sitting with this person? Did you go with this person? Did, what's this person's belief? And so on. These, these issues were there. So they had stopped attending the dars because they had heard that by attending this dars, they were becoming associated with the Ash'ari belief. And so they stopped going. Uh, Al-Muwaffaq ibn Qudamah, he said, فَلَقِي الْقَاضِي أَخِي يَوْمًا فَقَالَ لَهُ لِمَنْ قَطَعْتَ عَنْ الْإِشْتِغَالِ So the judge one day he met his brother, that is he met Abu Umar. And he said to him, why have you stopped attending? Why have you stopped coming? فَقَالَ لَهُ أَخِي قَالُوا إِنَّكَ أَشْعَرِي His brother said, Abu Umar, the people say you're an Ash'ari. فَقَالَ مَا أَنَا بِأَشْعَرِي the judge, he said, I'm not an Ash'ari. He said, I'm not, that's what they say about me, that's not true. I am not upon the madhab of the Ash'ari. That's not my belief. That's not what I believe. He said, but if you can study with me for one year, there won't be anybody like you. أو قال كنت تصير إماما أو كما قال or he said you'll become a great imam or what he said and if you can spend a year studying with me you're going to become a great imam now I want to stop there and ask how did he become a great imam in a year how do you become a great imam that is known in the whole Muslim world in a year the reality is that his seeking knowledge didn't start it didn't start with Ibn Asrun, the Shafi'i judge, didn't start with him. But what happened was that they were studying since they were small. Because remember, their father was a great scholar and a person of knowledge. And the father was imparting that knowledge and giving that knowledge to his children. And as we're going to hear, it was a family of students of knowledge. The women were famous for their knowledge. The men were famous for their knowledge. The knowledge was being, the houses were famous for their knowledge. We're going to hear some of the stories about how the house of the Maqdisi family was. And that when some of the, the women would take the classes for the other women, there was no space in the house to the point that the people were hanging onto the windows in order to attend the durus. So it was a family of knowledge. It was a fa an entire family from beginning to end, it was a family of knowledge. And so 
he developed that knowledge and grew with that knowledge locally and from his close family members. And then as Abu Umar and as Al-Muwaffaq ibn Qudama, as they became older, now they are, you know, they have traveled, they've got an opportunity to study from one of the great scholars of their time, this great Qadi, the great judge Ibn Asrun, the great Shafi'i judge. And he's saying to them, I can see in you, if you give me just one year of your time, you are going to become an imam in this religion. Or he said something similar to that. He said, oh, kama qal. He said, he said something similar to that. Either he said that there'll be nobody else like you, or he said you're going to become an imam. So now we're going to go back to look at the situation in the masjid. So the boys, the two, the two young men, that is Abu Umar and Al-Muwaffaq ibn Qudama, they are studying from the Shafi'i judge Ibn Asrun, who is the chief judge for Nur al-Din al-Zanki. And Nur al-Din, of course, as we said, was a man, he was a, the governor of Damascus and he was known for his righteousness as opposed to his father, who, as we said, was strongly inclined towards Shiism. So now what happened was, if we go back to look at the masjid, the Hanbali family, that is the family who owned or controlled the waqf of the masjid, the endowment, they came to complain to the sultan. They came to Nur al-Din to complain that, you know, we are unhappy. This man, Sheikh Ahmed, has come to the masjid. His family have come and they are intruding upon us. They're stepping on our toes and this is our endowment and we are you know, we want you to remove them from this masjid. Now, when they came to complain to Nur al-Din, who was there? Ibn Asrun, the Shafi'i judge. He defended the family and he mentioned their knowledge and he mentioned their righteousness. And he came to Nur al-Din, a Zanki, and he said to him that you need to do something for this family. You need to make a provision for this family, that the family of the Maqtisi family. You need to make a provision for them and, and a support for them. Because these are a people of knowledge and this is a family that is going to bring, inshallah, a great deal of good to Damascus, to Damascus and to the whole Muslim land. So make a provision for them. So Nur al-Din decided to remove the waqf from the Hanbali family and give the masjid completely to Ibn Qudama. That is to give it completely to Sheikh Ahmed. And this is amazing. Because now it sounds like what? He's going to take over the masjid, right? He's going to take over the masjid, he's going to teach, the masjid is going to become the madrasa, but that's not at all what happened. Not even close to what happened. So Nur al-Din pays a personal visit to Sheikh Ahmed. Not only Nur al-Din, because he's the Sultan. So Nur al-Din, his entourage, the whole, you know, the ministers, the whole thing, everybody comes. And he came and they asked Sheikh Ahmed and Nur al-Din said, I've come to deliver the pronouncement that this masjid and the waqf and the money, all of it is for you. And Sheikh Ahmed, he replied, لَمْ أُهَاجِرْ مِنْ بِلَادِي لِأُنَافِسَ النَّاسَ فِي دُنْيَاهُمْ He said, I didn't make hijrah to fight with the people over their dunya, to compete with the people over their dunya. I didn't leave my country to compete with the people in their worldly possessions. And he didn't take that offer. He didn't take the offer from Nur al-Din. Because he understood that if I take this offer, it's become a worldly thing. My hijrah has become a hijrah for the dunya. Whoever's hijrah is for something in the dunya to get hold of it or to marry a woman, they that's what they get out of their hijrah. Their hijrah is just that. There's no reward from Allah. It's just... They get the dunya they went for. He said, I didn't leave my country for the sake of the worldly possessions. I 
didn't leave my country to fight with the Hanbali family over who gets the money from the masjid. And he, he declined. And among the people who had a lot of love for the Sheikh was a man called Ahmed al-Kahfi. And he had some land that he owned in the foothills of the Qasiyun mountains. And he suggested to Sheikh Ahmed, why don't you move there? But the problem is this location was far from ideal. And Sheikh Ahmed was very inclined to move his family there. It was far from Damascus. And subhanAllah, the place was so remote and so dangerous and so kind of, you know, not known for, you know, wasn't particularly clean and so on. The people only used to go there to bury their dead. There were no residents at all in that place. And thieves and robbers were known to gather there. So completely desolate, completely isolated place. Far from Damascus, inhabited by thieves and robbers. A place where there are no residents and a place where people only go through there on the way to the mountain to bury their dead. And they had a, a maqbara, a cemetery, a bit further on. And the people only passed by that place to bury the dead. And Ahmed al-Kahfi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he's, he offered Sheikh Ahmed, I'll give you a place to, to build your home and a place to build a masjid. And when Sheikh Ahmed, he came, he stood on the land that was designated for the masjid. And he went down to the Azid River. He made wudu and he prayed. And he said, ma hadha illa mawdi'un mubarak. He said, I believe this place, it is a blessed place. This is a place which inshallah, it's going to be a place of blessings. And in 555 after the Hijrah, he moved there. Now you imagine, he's left his, his, his country of Philistine, of Beit al-Maqdis. He's come to Sham, to Damascus. He came to a mosquito infested uh, place which was filthy and a place where people were dying of malaria and he lost uh, many of his family. And the place that he's now moving to is worse than the place that he's left in terms of its, uh, you know, what is there in terms of the thieves, the robbers, the danger there. And they say about Sheikh Ahmed, he was not a builder, you know, he was not experienced in building homes or in, you know, it wasn't a laborer. But every day he used to go and put a number of stones on top of the other one. Al-Muwaffaq ibn Qudama rahimahullah ta'ala reported that they had neither strength nor experience to build anything. He said, we didn't know how to build a house with stones and we weren't strong enough to do it. We were not laborers. He said, but my father, he used to come and just put a few stones, one stone on top of the other stone. People in the area heard what the sheikh was doing and they went to help, and with the help of Allah and then the help of those people, they completed three or four houses. At this time, his family is still staying in the masjid of Abi Salih al Hambari. And he took his family out from the area of the masjid, and Sheikh Ahmed, he took one house, Al Muwaffaq ibn Qudama took one house, and Abu Umar took one house. And Sheikh Ahmed took one house, Abu Umar took one house, and Al Muwaffaq took one house. And this reminds you of the famous, famous statement لا تحقرن صغيرة إن الجبال من الحصى. Don't belittle something small. Mountains are only made out of pebbles. The situation was so bad in the place where they lived that they used to guard their houses at night out of a fear of kidnappers who would kidnap the children and sell them to the crusaders. They also lived in fear of wild animals like wolves that would attack the children. And finally, by the grace of Allah, they were able to build a gate around these three or four houses to protect the children from wolves. SubhanAllah, you imagine the situation they are in, that they are they have thieves who are trying to steal their children, kidnap their children, and sell them to the crusaders. 
and they are also scared that a wolf will come and eat their children. And they had a sister, any of the two brothers, Abu Umar and uh, Abu Umar al Muwaffaq. They had a sister called Ruqayya. She died 621 after the Hijrah. She said to her brothers, each take one house. And she said, all the rest of us stayed in one house. I mean, SubhanAllah, the situation was very, very constricted. The space was very limited. And it's actually narrated that she said that she thought most of them would die anyway. She said, I, I didn't think that, to be honest. So, so what they did is that, that uh, Al-Muwaffaq took a house and his family moved in. And Abu Umar took a house and his family moved in. And all the rest of the family of Sheikh Ahmed, they moved into one small house. And she said, to be honest, the sister Ruqayya, she said, to be honest, we didn't really think that most of us will make it because there were a lot of health. They were very, very sick. The area was not suited to living in. Uh, they had migrated a long way. They had suffered a great deal. And, and they didn't, you know, they, they were not, the, their health outlook was very bad. And she believed that it's likely that most of the, most of the people in the house will die. So at least if, if the, there were two healthy families or somewhat healthy families, they let them take a house each and then the rest of the people, they went into one house. Ruqayya, she actually turned out to be the mother of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahid, who is known as Al-Diya al-Maqdisi. He died 643 after the Hijrah. He was the great scholar of hadith of the people of Sham, and she was known as a person of great knowledge and memorization. She was the mother of Al-Diya al-Maqdisi. So this is another what we're bringing in now. We had what Sheikh Ahmed, Abu Umar, Al-Muwaffaq ibn Qudama, and Al-Diya al-Maqdisi. And Al-Diya al-Maqdisi, his mother was Ruqayya, who was the sister of Abu Umar, and Al-Muwaffaq ibn Qudama. She herself was a person who was known for great knowledge and memorization. Eventually, by the grace of Allah, the houses increased and the entire area became full of people of knowledge. Because what happened was they started a foundation. And with these small houses and when people knew there were people of knowledge there, people of knowledge flocked to all come together in one place. And so people used to come and uh, Ahmed al-Kahfi had assigned some of the land for them. And the people would come and be able just to build a house. And then the community would grow and grow and grow. And it grew so much that it was again visited this time by the Sultan, by Nur al-Din. And he would come and ask about his family and he would come and ask about the masjid. And people would bring gifts. They would bring gifts for the family. And the area became so righteous that the people began to call it as salihiyyah This area that the, the, the area that Ahmad al-Kahfi he gave Rahimahullah Ta'ala, they called it as salihiyyah For one of two reasons. The, the reason that we think is likely is because of the salah of the people, the righteousness of the people. But some of them, some of the Maqdisi family said that wasn't the reason. It was because they came from the masjid of Abi Salih, the masjid of Abu Salih. And because of they, came, they came from the masjid of Abu Salih, it became known as as salihiyya the people of the masjid of Abu Salih. As... Sheikh Ahmed became older. He started to spend more time alone and he began to separate himself from the people. And he left his eldest son, Abu Umar, with full responsibility for the family and all their affairs. And he used to isolate himself in his room for worship. And he died in the year 558 after the Hijrah at the age of 67 years old, seven years after he left under the threat of assassination from Balian of Ibelin. And he came to Damascus. Seven years after that event, he died. His son Abu Umar, rahimahullah ta'ala, is the founder 
of Al Madrasa Al Umariya. And that's the name where the name comes from, from Abu Umar, Ibn Ahmad, Ibn Muhammad, Ibn Qudama, Al Maqdisi. From those few rocks that were put together, Abu Umar, the few rocks that his father used to stand one on top and they used to say, we don't know how to build anything, but we just put a few rocks on top and we try our best. And then the people came and they gave them some help after the help of Allah. And then the people migrated and it became a settlement until it became so famous that the Sultan visited that settlement to ask about the condition of Sheikh Ahmed and his family. When Sheikh Ahmed passed away, Abu Umar took care of his family. And this is from one of the strangest things when you read the biography of Abu Umar. You read that it's mentioned that he doubled the worship of his father. And he was known for, for double what his father was known for. And he was passionate about teaching the Quran. After the Salam of Fajr, he would teach the Quran until Duha time. And he would lengthen his Duha. He used to, whatever he took, I mean, said he used to love to, to drink milk and whatever he would eat, he would divide it in two and he would give half of it to the people. And the people said that he gave everything that he owned in charity to the point that he gave all of his winter clothes away, keeping only one set of clothing that didn't protect him from the cold. Al Imam al Dhahabi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said the family used to remind the people of the life of the Salaf. He wouldn't hear a hadith without acting upon it. It's said that he prayed 72 raka'at of sunnah every day. His daily routine, it was to teach the Quran after Fajr without moving until the sun rises. And he would then pray al duha and lengthen it until Dhuhr would come close. At that time, there was no published mushaf. And if he saw someone who hadn't memorized, he would write the mushaf from his hand and he would give it out in charity to them. He would take a, a fresh uh, set of paper or papers or scrolls and he would write out for them the mushaf and he would give it to them as a gift if he saw that they had not memorized the Quran. And if he saw someone who wasn't praying properly, he would write for them Mukhtasar al Khiraqi, which was explained by his brother Al Muwaffaq ibn Qudama in Al Mughni in 26 volumes. If he found that there was a war taking place, he would leave everything and he would go. He participated in 23 military expeditions, including the battles of Nur ad-Din and including the conquest of Jerusalem with Salah ad-Din. If he heard of a janazah, he would rush to it and pray it and bury the body. And he would try to give sadaqah every single day, but if he didn't have enough, he would leave it until Friday. He used to eat one time per day. He divided it in two and would share it with the first person that he saw. And he was known for commanding good and he was known for forbidding evil. I'm going to read you some of the things that he said. I find some of the things that he said, I, I summarize this from his, his biography. Some of the things that he said, it's amazing. He said, In lam yakun sadaqah يعلم أنه إلى صدقاته أحوج من الفقير إليها لم تنفعه صدقاته قالوا وكيف ذلك قال إذا لم تتصدق لم يتصدق أحد عنكم والسائل إن لم تعطوا أنتم أعطاه غيركم He said if the one giving sadaqa doesn't know that he needs his sadaqa more than the poor person does his charity will not benefit him. The people said, how is it that the rich person needs sadaqah more than the poor person? He said, if you don't give charity, nobody else is going to give charity on your behalf. But the poor person, if you don't give to them, somebody else will give to them. It's said that in the end of the period of his life, he used to fast continuously and he wouldn't break his fast except for aid, sickness or a valid excuse. His family actually rebuked him about this. They said to him that, you know, why are you just fasting like this? He said, I'm only fasting to take benefit from the days I have left. If I become weak, I will be unable to fast. And if I die, my deeds will cease. He wrote quite a lot of, of poetry. He's got a very nice urjuza, a very nice 
poem in the Urjuza style. <clears throat> Maybe I can read a, a little bit of it. It's, he's got some very, very nice poetry. He said, Inni aqulu fasma'u Inni aqulu fasma'u bayani Ya ma'ashara al-ashabi wal-khullani Usikum bil-adli wal-ihsani Wal-birri wal-taqwa ma'al imani فَاسْتَمْسَكُوا بِطَاعَةِ الرَّحْمَانِ وَاجْتَنِبُوا الرِّجْسَ مِنَ الْأَوْثَانِ وَاجْتَنِبُوا مَكَايِدَ الشَّيْطَانِ فَإِنَّهُ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعُدْوَانِ وَالْكُفْرِ وَالْفُسُوقِ وَالْكُفْرِ وَالْفُسُوقِ وَالْعِصْيَانِ وَالْبَغْيِ وَالْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْبُهْتَانِ يُزَيِّنُ الْغُرُورَ لِلْإِنْسَانِ ثُمَّ قَصَاهُ قَصَارَاهُ إِلَى الْخِذْلَانِ كَفِعْلِهِ يَوْمَ الْتَقَى الْجَمْعَانِ ما هذه الدنيا لكم بشاني فارفضوها لتقى الرحمن فإنها دار أولي الأضغان وذمها في محكم القرآن سرورها قد شيب بالأحزان ألا كل من عليها فاني إن الغني والفقير إن الغني he said uh, إن الغني والفقير يعرفان عند ظهور الربح والخسران بعد عبور الجسر والميزان He said Indeed I say so hear my explanation O group of my companions and beloved I advise you with justice and excellence and righteousness and taqwa along with iman Hold on to obedience to the most merciful and keep away from the filth of idols and keep away from the plots of the shaitan for he certainly commands transgression and disbelief and defiance and disobedience and transgression and immorality and slander. He beautifies deception for mankind. Then his efforts end in failure. Like his actions on the day when the two armies met and the worldly life has no importance to you. Reject it in order to protect from the punishment of the most merciful for it is the abode of those who rankle, of those of rancor. It has been disparaged in the unequivocal verses of the Qur'an. Its moments of happiness turn grey because of sadness. Everything on it will perish. True riches and poverty will only be known when profit and loss become apparent after crossing the sirat and the weighing of your deeds. He has some amazing poetry. He has more than that, but I, I will just quote, and he will quote just, just some of it. But he has some amazing, amazing poetry. Abu Umar was a person known for his dhikr and his remembrance of Allah. And he said that when he died, he died while he was making dhikr. And that's why it's famously said, whoever lives doing something will die upon it. And whoever dies doing something will be raised doing it. Ibn Kathir mentioned this as a statement. Uh, the last part of it is, is part of a hadith, but the whole part of it is not a hadith. He died 607 after the hijrah. And they said that 20,000 people participated in his janazah and Damashq became crowded. And he died without leaving behind any wealth except for his madrasa, al-madrasa, al-umariyya. He had many children and there are actually many children we could talk about, the children of, 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 of Abi Umar. But uh, I want to talk about one of his daughters, Amina. She was born 555 after the hijrah when they first established in Madrasa al umariya she died 631. She memorized the whole Qur'an. She was a reciter of the Qur'an and she learned all of the Qira'at and she used to teach the women. She was a muqriya, she was someone who the people would read the Qur'an to her and a scholar of hadith. She took knowledge from Abu Fatih Muhammad ibn Abdul Baqi and others directly. And there was a time when the great Imam uh, Al-Fakhr ibn Bukhari who is Ali ibn Ahmed ibn Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi, took from her directly and he had the shortest chain of narration of anyone of his time. al Dhahabi said about her that the house would be so packed that people would be hanging on to the windows. And al Diya al-Maqdisi, who we mentioned from his mother Ruqayya, was married to her daughter. He said, مَا أَعْلَمُ رَأَيْتُ مْرَأَةً وَلَا رَجُلًا فِي الْخَيْرِ مِثْلَهَا he said, I don't know that I ever saw a man or a woman as good as her. 
وسافرت معها إلى مكة وما أظن كاتبيها كتب عليها خطيئة He said I traveled with her to Mecca and I cannot see that her two scribes wrote down a single sin for her ولا أعرف لها سيئة and I never knew that she did a sin that's not she didn't do a sin but I never saw her commit a sin وكانت كثيرة الصدقة she used to give a great deal of charity and she would call people to speak to them in private and give them charity and one day Al-Diyah Al-Maqdisi came to her while she was giving and she cried because she felt that she was showing off because he came to her in the time he caught her giving charity to someone and she started crying because she felt that she had showed off as relates to, to or as regards Al-Madrasat al umariyah Abu Umar had decided during his lifetime that the whole place of living should be turned into a madrasa to produce people of knowledge. The madrasa taught classes of fiqh, hadith, aqidah, usul al-fiqh, nahu, and it started very, very small. It got so big that it reached 300 endowments and 100,000 students. It reached 300 endowments and 100,000 students. Al-Muwaffaq ibn Qudama wrote his books of fiqh taught like a university syllabus. Uh, Jamal al-Din uh, Sarsari, he said, في عصرنا كان الموفق حجة على فقهه الثبت الأصول معولي كفى الخلق بالكاف وأقنع طالبا بمقنع فقه أن كاتب مطول أن كتاب مطولي وأغنى بمغني الفقه من كان باحثا وعمدته من يعتمدها يحصل وروضته ذات الأصول كروضة أماست بها الأزهار أنفاس أنفاس شمأري تدل على المنطوق أقوى دلالة وتحمل في المفهوم أحسن محمل. He said in our time al muwaffaq was an authority. In his fiqh, he was precise, a scholar of principles who was relied upon. He sufficed the people with his book Al-Kafi and convinced a student with Al-Muqni in, his, in fiqh rather than a, a book of many volumes. He enriched us with Al-Muqni in fiqh. He enriched the one who researches with Al-Muqni in fiqh and his umda, whoever depends upon it, will achieve. His rawda, containing principles, is like a garden which produces flowers of value and variation. It shows you what is understood from words with the strongest of evidences and it interprets what is understood from the meanings with the best of interpretations. So it's like he wrote an entire syllabus of books. He wrote an entire syllabus of books. Uh, each one of them, Al-Kafi, Al-Muqni, Al-Mughni, Rawda, uh, and he wrote that entire syllabus while he was at al madrasa al umariya He later went with his cousin who is Abdul Ghani bin Abdul Wahid al maqdisi So this is another great scholar, uh, another great, great scholar of Islam. He died 600 after the Hijrah. And he was Abdul Ghani ibn Abdul Wahid al maqdisi he died 600 after the Hijrah and he went to Iraq. They went to Iraq together to study from Abdul Qadir Al Jailani. Abdul Qadir Al Jailani was a, he died 561 after the Hijrah. He was a Hanbali scholar who was upon the aqeed of Ahl Sunnah. But the Sufis exaggerated regarding him to the extent they started to worship him. He has a book called Al Ghunya and Sheikh Al Islam ibn Taymiyyah even mentioned that there are situations where these people, they go to the grave and the shaitan appears to them in the shape of the sheikh and calls out to them. So they start to worship the sheikh and they start to believe they've been spoken to by the, this imam, by the dead imam, Qadir al-Jailani. So the point is that Abdul Ghani al-Maqdisi and uh, al-Muwaffaq, they went together to study from the great imam Abdul Qadir al-Jailani. More than 200 imams whose books you read today either authored their works in al madrasat al umariyah or studied there. And it used to stand until very, very recently. 
and subhanAllah very very recent, recent and relatively recent troubles in Syria it was the first time that it that it fell and it, and it no longer existed until very very recently that madrasa stayed so who studied in al madrasa al umariya let's give some examples abdul ghani ibn abdul wahid al maqdisi who is the author of what of umdatul ahkam the famous book umdatul ahkam which many of us study many of us have studied many of us attend classes for it this book was written by Someone who studied, it was written by Abdul Ghani al Maqdisi, it was written by who studied in al Madrasatul al Awariya. Ibn al Salah, the author of Muqaddimah uh, in the science of hadith, the famous Muqaddimah of Ibn al Salah. Al Nawawi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Shaykh al Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, uh, Alam al Din al Birzali, the scholar of history. Jamal al-Din al-Mizzi, the author of Tahdeeb al-Kamal, Shams al-Din Muhammad ibn Ahmed ibn Abd al-Hadi, the author of Al-Muharrar, Fil Hadith, Shams al-Din Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr ibn Ayyub ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, Imad al-Din ibn Kathir, Umar ibn Kathir, Zayn al-Din al-Iraqi, the author of Fatih al-Maghith and the teacher of Al-Hafid ibn Hajar, Shihab al-Din Abu al-Fadl Ahmed ibn Nur al-Din Ali ibn Muhammad ibn Hajar al-Asqalani the famous author of Fath al-Bari Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti the author of many works including Al-Itqan and many others these are just some of the names of the people who passed through Al-Madrasa al-Umariya in one capacity or another the thing with Al-Madrasa al-Umariya is that it started small with sincerity they didn't belittle small righteous actions. Honestly, you can take a lesson from this, that whatever you achieve in your studies and your life, it will be in line with your own personal actions. And that's one thing that is really important here because when you look at Sheikh Ahmed, yes, he had a great deal of knowledge. Yes, he went to study. But ultimately, what's known from him are his actions, the things he did personally in his own life, the sacrifices he made in his own life, along with the knowledge he had. It's very sad that in this kind of day and age, we kind of in a situation where people are known for the amount of information they know, the amount of kind of books they've read or certificates they have. Whereas in those days, people used to be known for the deeds they did with the knowledge that they had. And really, all that is left really is to ask, how did we end up with a, an institute called al Madrasa al Umariya? Really, it, it's from the point of view of inspiration, you know, to be inspired, to have something to, to look up to, um, to have something to follow, an example to follow, uh, of a way that, that people can seek knowledge you know, through reliable sources, inshallah, through the books of the people of knowledge and through the scholars of Islam and the great legacy of, of, of scholarship in Islam. And people can do so in an authentic way and in an easy way through online an online medium. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure Al-Madras al Amariya would love to have a, a physical place built from, you know, a few stones a day. But at this moment in time, it's an online project that we have right now. And alhamdulillah, so far by the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, it's gone really, really well. And uh, really that is by the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal alone. And it continues to be inspired by the example of Sheikh Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi and his sons Abu Umar and his son al muwaffaq ibn Qudama, and indeed uh, among the daughters of Sheikh Ahmed, we heard about Ruqayya, who was the mother of Dhiya al Maqdisi, and we heard also about the daughter of Abu Umar Amina, who was well known for her, uh, her memorization of the Quran, her teaching of hadith. She was a great scholar of hadith. So the whole family and what they achieved, Abdul Ghani and and the whole family, rahimahumullah ta'ala, continue to be an inspiration for 
Al Madrasa Al Umariya, the online project that we have, uh, for something for for us to look up to and to see what can be done, just by planting a stone or two every single day, and by staying true to the principles of the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I'm really, really, you know, it's it's amazing to be able to share that story with you. Uh, and uh, to give you a bit of background as to where our name came from, but more importantly to share that legacy of uh, Al Madrasa Al Umariya in Damascus and, and what it was built upon, how it was built. And the thing is that SubhanAllah, you could look into the, the biographies of every single one of those people and their, their biography itself is written in, in pages and pages, each individual person. But what I just tried to do is to just bring it all together into a kind of a cohesive story. And inshallah, also I tried as much as possible to bring real quotes from the history books from people who witnessed it, not to make it a story that is just a story of something that you know people imagined it was like that. But actually much of this is actually narrated word for word from Al-Muwaffaq ibn Qudama, rahimahullah ta'ala, when he narrated how his father migrated and he narrated also the condition of the family and likewise Abdul Ghani and others, they also narrated um, authentic reports about what happened and we tried to take a lot of what we presented to you today from uh, from those reports inshallah. I'm not sure if we have an option in this live class for questions or not. Uh, maybe someone from the AMEU team can drop me a quick uh, message and let me know. Uh, otherwise inshallah ta'ala that's kind of the end of what I wanted to, to talk to you about. I would just encourage everybody that people still continue to attend the classes, inshallah. Um, really, I would encourage two things. I would encourage continue to attend the, 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 this conference, inshallah, as it continues. I believe we have a number of lectures coming up in different languages, inshallah ta'ala. I will actually get the program up and, and I, will, uh, I will tell you about some of the things that are going on, inshallah. Okay, so after today we have, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we have three more lectures remaining. We have in the Urdu language, Sheikh Dhafar Al-Hassan, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, again at the same time, inshallah, he's going to be giving a lecture on the 31st of December. Uh, Sheikh Abdul Hamid, Hafizahullah, is going to be giving a lecture in Urdu on the 2nd of January, and Sheikh Abdul Rahman Hassan, inshallah, on the 6th, on the, don't know if it's the 6th or the, Fourth, I will check. Uh, he's going to be giving a lecture in Somali, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, so all of these lectures are coming up, inshallah ta'ala. It's the first time that we did a multilingual conference. So do share that with people, inshallah ta'ala. And the second thing that I would honestly say is that for people to, yeah, it's the, for Sheikh Abdul Rahman, it's the 4th of January. So the 31st for Sheikh Dafar and the 2nd for Sheikh Abdul Hamid and the 4th of January for Sheikh Abdul Rahman Hassan, inshallah. And those are in Urdu, Urdu and Somali, uh, inshallah ta'ala. This is the last of the conference lectures, the virtual conference lectures in the English language, inshallah. But inshallah ta'ala, there is still a lot of stuff coming up. So I would honestly say that if you haven't yet subscribed to Al Madras Tul Amaliyah on YouTube, please do so. Again, try to stay in touch. There are all kinds of different groups and social media groups and what have you. You can find Al Madrasa Al Umariya on uh, most of those uh, popular platforms, uh, Telegram and so on, inshallah. And uh, keep in touch with what's going on with Al Madrasa Al Umariya. We recently launched our junior mentorship program, which has been going really, really well by the grace of Allah. That's happening every Saturday and Sunday. 
and that program is for kids from the age of, I think there's two bands, seven to uh, 12 and 13 to 19 approximately. Um, and inshallah, we, we, we're taking them through a full year of teaching, tutoring and mentorship um, every Saturday and Sunday, Walilai Alhamd. But there is much, much more to come, inshallah. And there are some amazing announcements coming uh, for where we want to take al Madras to al And what you see right now in terms of the online classes is a tiny fraction of the content that we have available, that we've recorded, that we've prepared, that we've planned. So, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, by the grace of Allah and with his help, and with tawfiq from Allah and with Allah's aid, we would be able, inshallah ta'ala, to share even more content with you, classes with you, uh, courses with you. So please do stay in touch. Uh, visit the website, amu.org, and inshallah you can find out more about what's going on and you can stay up to date with the programs that we have. Uh, I don't know, do we have any, did we say we have an option, uh, comments or anything like that? We have an option for q and I'm just waiting, maybe you can get... To, one of the team to tell me. Let's ask. Maybe it's late for those guys over there. Okay, it doesn't look like it, right? Okay, inshallah. So that's what Allah Azza wa made easy for us to mention uh, this evening. I hope that the story provided uh, a lot of food for thought and a lot of inspiration, inshallah. Uh, and Allah Azza wa knows best whatever I said that was uh, correct and true, then that is from the grace of Allah and His mercy. And if I made a mistake in any part of what I said, then that is a mistake from myself and Allah and his messenger and indeed uh, the, the, the sheikh and his family have nothing to do with the mistakes that I made in transmitting this story to you. That's what Allah made easy for me to mention. Allah knows best.